Greenberg. I'm the Senior Director of Scholarship and Policy at the Association of Research Libraries. Um, happy Open Access Week and welcome to the first of two sessions of the 2020 Tome Stakeholders Meeting, um, our author roundtable. The second session, Where Are We Now?, will begin at 1 o'clock Eastern on, this, on the same Zoom link. On behalf of the Association of Research Libraries, I would like to enthusiastically welcome the five authors of Tome-funded monographs in our roundtable this morning, and all of you for joining us to hear their experiences with open access and their thoughts on the future of OA monographs in their disciplines. I would also like to thank the planning committee for this program, uh, Peter Potter, Barbara Klein-Pope, Eric Van Rijn, David Hansen, and Kate McCready. So thank you for, for putting together a terrific program. Tome is a partnership among ARL, AU Presses, and the Association of American Universities. As the host of today's Zoom, a reminder that this meeting is governed by the ARL Code of Conduct. Over to you, Peter. Thanks, Judy, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Burgery, and I have the uh, privilege of serving as the Executive Director of the Association of University Presses. Uh, my pronouns are he and him, and I am speaking you, to you today from the traditional and ancestral lands of the Miccosukee and Seminole people. Uh, I won't uh, continue much further on for now. I think I'll have a few things to say at the end of the session. I'm very excited to hear uh, what our author panel has to say. Uh, and in general, very excited uh, uh, over the energy uh, and momentum uh, that the project seems to have garnered over the last 12 months. So looking forward to a good day's conversation. Uh, over to you, Jessica. Hi. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Jessica Sibiak. I am the Deputy Vice President for Federal Relations and Council for Policy at the Association of American Universities. Like my colleagues at a, uh, a, excuse me, ARL and AU Presses, sorry, we have so many acronyms in, in Washington, DC, it's sometimes hard to keep them straight. Uh, but like my colleagues, I, I am thrilled to be here. Um, and this is a, a very important initiative uh, for AAU. Um, and we've certainly been thinking of late amidst this pandemic, um, the need for, for open access um, and widely available materials, scholarly materials on the internet. Is, is more important now than it has ever been when people literally can't go to the library um, and sometimes physically can't leave their home. So, so we are, are thrilled and, and very, looking very much forward to the conversation today. Um, so now it is my privilege and pleasure to, to introduce uh, Peter Potter. Um, Peter is um, a visiting program officer uh, at uh, ARL. Um, and he has really been absolutely central to ensuring that that Tome continues to evolve and develop um, and, and really, you know, I'll, I'll also take the liberty of speaking for uh, Peter Berkeley and Judy and saying that I, I don't think we would be here today um, without Peter. So without further ado, I will, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Jess, I appreciate that. Um, so, uh, Thanks to everyone for joining us today. I'm really excited about um, having this uh, panel today. Um, as uh, Jessica told you, uh, my name is Peter Potter. I'm Publishing Director at Virginia Tech and the ARL Visiting Program Officer for Tome. Um, we have a distinguished group of scholars uh, here today who are going to share their experiences with open access and their thoughts on the future of open access monographs in their disciplines. Uh, first though, a word about Tome, uh, just as background for, for anyone who's relatively new to um, this. Um, Angela, next slide. So Tome is a five-year pilot project launched in 2017 by the Association of American Universities, the Association of Research Libraries, and the Association of University Presses. Um, Tome brings together scholars, universities, libraries, and presses in pursuit of a common goal, a sustainable open monograph ecosystem. Um, next slide, please. Um, so how it works in very basic terms is that um, participating uh, universities provide baseline grants of $15,000 to support the publication of open access monographs. The grants go directly to publishers and the participating um, university presses, the publishers commit to producing digital open access editions, openly licensing them under Creative Commons licenses and depositing the files in selected 
repositories. They can still publish print editions as they normally would. Um, part of what we did with Tome was to try to maintain as much of the um, traditional peer review process that uh, publishers are used to and disrupting as little as possible the, um, the workflows of university presses. Um, and we believe that Tome increases the presence of humanities and social science scholarship on the web and opens up knowledge to a truly global leadership readership. Um, we're starting the fourth year of the pilot. So uh, we are at a really at a pivotal point. Um, now for a few words about the format of today's discussion. Um, the format will be what I hope is a lightly structured conversation among a diverse group of authors. And I'll just say as moderator, I expect my job to be much easier than uh, Kristen Welker's will be tonight at the presidential debate in Nashville. <laughs> um, much easier. Um, so um, next slide, please. Um, all of our uh, distinguished authors have published at least one book, um, some more than that. Some of the books have been open access, but not all. Um, and not all are Tome authors. Uh, we wanted to have a range of experience to bring to this panel. Um, and although not are all Tome authors, all, all have some direct experience with open access publishing, which they will tell you about. Um, and we have a, it, it's an interesting group here. We have two historians, an anthropologist, one scholar whose work spans multiple disciplines in the medical sciences and humanities, and a scholar of modern Chinese studies. So um, without further ado, let me introduce the panel and we'll get the conversation going. Um, let me just say that I have a, the format today we have, we'll go for about 50 minutes <clears throat> and I have a set of questions that I'll use to create Get the discussion going. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, I'm not sure that it'll depend on whether we get to them in this section, um, how, how, the, how going through these questions that I have goes, but when we take a break, um, after about 15 minutes, we'll take about a 10 minute break, then afterwards we'll have open discussion and take um, questions uh, from anyone who um, has questions. <clears throat> so, um, we have our authors are Ed Ballison, who is Professor of History and Public Policy and Vice Provost for Interdisciplinary Studies at Duke University. Angus Bergen is Associate Professor of History at uh, the Johns Hopkins University. Uh, Nicholas Copeland is an anthropologist and Associate Professor in the Department of Sociology at Virginia Tech. Uh, Debolina Roy is Professor of Neuroscience and Behavioral Biology and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Emory University. And she's also taking on a new role uh, at Emory as Senior Associate Dean of Faculty uh, for the Emory College of Arts and Sciences. And finally, we have Emily Wilcox, um, it, who is Associate Professor of Modern Chinese Studies and Associate Chair and Director of Graduate Studies in the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures at the University of Michigan. Um, welcome everybody. So to begin, uh, I'd like each of you to uh, give your name and affiliation as well as um, tell us what your most recent uh, monograph that you've published um, and kind of a little bit about um, the experience of that. So um, well, why don't we start with uh, Ed? Good morning, thanks, Peter. Um, so my most recent book, which came out in 2017, uh, was uh, Fraud, an American History from Barnum to Madoff. Uh, that came out with Princeton University Press. Uh, it was not open access um, and uh, had a, a another volume come out that same year, actually an edited collection, um, Policy Shock, uh, Recalibrating Risk and Regulation After Oil Spills, Nuclear Disasters, and Financial Crises that was co-edited with three other Duke faculty members. Um, that came out with uh, Cambridge University Press, also not open access. And um, I, I will tell you that, I'll, I'll say a, a little bit about the, the second volume actually, because that one uh, came in with such a high price point that I feel like the dissemination of it has been really limited in, in ways that are um, 
uh, very disappointing actually to me and to my co-authors, uh, co-editors and the other, and the many, many uh, scholars who contributed to the volume. Um, so it's actually reinforced an interest that I have in, in open access um, and uh, looking forward to the discussion today. Great, um, Angus. Thank you. Yeah, I think I'm the other person whose book uh, was not uh, uh, published open access. It was uh, called The Great Persuasion. It came out with Harvard University Press in uh, 2012. Um, and I'm also a, a editor of, a, of, a, of an academic journal uh, that's been trying to navigate the, the transition to open access that many journals are confronting as well. It's Modern Intellectual History. It's published with Cambridge University Press. All right, uh, Nick Copeland. Uh, you're muted. I thought I was hitting my space bar there. Um, hi, my name is Nick Copeland. I'm an associate professor of sociology at Virginia Tech, uh, which is located on the traditional homeland of the Tutelo Monacan peoples. I do research uh, in Guatemala as an anthropologist, and the title of my open access monograph is The Democracy Development Machine neoliberalism, radical pessimism, and authoritarian populism in Mayan Guatemala. And that was published on Cornell University Press. And so far it's been a real great experience and an, you know, an honor to have my work be open access in this way. Great. Um, Debelina? Hi everyone, I'm Debelina. Um, I also want to do a land acknowledgement. I'm here in Atlanta and uh, this is the traditional homelands of the Muskogee Creek people. Um, I am a interdisciplinary scholar um, between the natural sciences and humanities. And for me, uh, I have had an interest in open access projects for some time. Uh, it's kind of linked to my, my work in the field of feminist science and technology studies um, and the idea of a democratizing of, of knowledge. So uh, I started a journal with some colleagues back in 2012. We started working on an open access journal. It's called Catalyst, uh, Feminism, Techno Science and Theory. And um, once that kind of got going in 2015, I knew that when I was gonna open, uh, you know, uh, publish my first monograph that I would like it to be open access. And so my book came out in 2018. It's called Molecular Feminisms, Biology Becomings and Life in the Lab. Great. Um, and finally, Emily um, Wilcox. Hi, everyone. Um, so the, I published my first book in 2018 with the University of California Press, and it is open access and supported by a Tome grant. Um, it's called Revolutionary Bodies, Chinese Dance and the Socialist Legacy. Um, and I, I would say that in the process of publishing that book, I went from never having heard of open access and really not knowing anything about what it is to being a strong advocate now for it. And so um, I sit on the committee for the Tome grants at University of Michigan now, and I've um, encouraged several of my colleagues to participate. And I really do see it as an honor to have um, the financial support to be able to make my work um, so much more easily circulated around the world. Great, that's, a, that's an excellent opening. So um, uh, first question I have um, is for the, uh, three of you who have published open access, uh, whose recent books were open access. Um, can you tell us why you agreed to or were persuaded to publish at OA? Um, why don't we start with Emily and work, work back? Um, sure. So <clears throat> when I was um, looking for presses for my book, my primary considerations were um, the prestige of the press in my field. And that was what I was told to focus on by my mentors because it was my tenure book. Um, and so that was you know, really how I made the choice of who to reach out to. And University of California Press was my first choice. And so when they got back to me and said they were interested um, and right at the very beginning, it was Reed Malcolm at the very beginning, he said, we're interested. And also we wanna place it in this new project we have called Luminous, which is open access. And so it was kind of like the combination of getting the uh, positive response from my top press and then also getting this other information about something I you know, didn't really know much about. Uh, so I went back to my mentors and it was kind of interesting. So I had two mentors that had two different responses to that information. So one person said, <clears throat> well, open access could be tricky when you go up for tenure because um, some people might equate it with self-publishing. And so then I went to my other mentor and my other mentor said, um, 
I don't think you're that first mentor actually understands. I'm he was he, my other mentor was on the tenure and promotion committee for the university at that time. And both of them were very experienced. I think they just had different levels of um, maybe comfort with risk, perhaps. You know, I think both of them were trying to give me the best advice possible. But um, the second person said, what really matters is that you'd be publishing it with University of California Press. The other thing that Reed Malcolm said in the email very clearly was that the review process would be identical. So we had that in writing that it would be identical. And he said, based on that, um, there'd be no problem with tenure. And actually this is a privilege because potentially you could reach a wider audience. And I think at some point in the back and forth with Reed, other things that came up or that um, there would still be a hard copy, which was really important to me to being my first book. You know, I wanted to have something physical that I could tangible. Um, so so that, made, that was made a difference to me to know that. Um, he said that, you know, a big part that was a benefit for me was being able to have this multimedia component because I work on dance and performance. And so I had wanted to have a multimedia component and there are different ways that that had been done. I'd seen with other books, like having a DVD, for example, that I didn't think were that well integrated. And so I saw that the Luminous platform had this really great opportunity to actually integrate the videos into the digital text. So as you're reading the ebook, you can click and it'll just play within the book. So that to me was a huge incentive to be able to integrate the videos so closely into the text. Um, and then also we discussed a little bit about the price of the book and I realized that the price was also very reasonable. Um, and so overall, it just seemed like a fabulous opportunity um, and then at some point, um, Reed also mentioned to me that Michigan had this tome um, grant option. So he was the one who told me about that. I actually didn't know about it from my, you know, just I hadn't heard about it yet. And so he said, here, you can, you know, apply for this. And so I applied. Um, and so then it kind of all fell into place at that point. Um, yeah, that's, that's very helpful. And you might mention too, um, some people might not know the Luminos program and with that is California's series, a uh, very innovative series for um, publishing open access books. And one of the things that I'm curious about whether this, your book is a Luminos book and it's a tome book. And some people might think, well, how can they be both? And part of what we do with tome is we try to work with um, the different um, open access uh, initiatives out there. University of North Carolina Press has a, um, uh, series now for uh, history monographs, and um, we've, we've worked with them um, as well. So did, uh, Emily, was it confusing at all to you at the beginning with sort of navigating that um, tome, Luminos, University of California? Um, not to me, because the way I understood it was that Luminos was the series that it would be part of at the press. And then the next step for me as the author was, you know, I had to get the subvention. And so where was I going to get the money for the subvention? And so that was, I saw Tome as being associated with the subvention and Luminous being associated with the publication. So it didn't seem confusing to me. Great. Yeah, that's, that's the way we, we uh, intend it. So that's, that's great. Um, uh, Debelina, why don't you uh, tell us a bit about um, your rationale? Sure. Well, as I mentioned, you know, I was already interested in open access um, publications. But I think there was a series of very fortunate events that also aligned with when I was starting to write the book. Um, and that is at, at Emory um, College, um, we were able to get a, a great um, grant, a grant from the Mellon Foundation on, on digital humanities. And uh, Sarah McKee, who might be actually listening in on this call, um, she uh, is appointed as the director of this grant and uh, was you know, reaching out to faculty who might be working on a, a humanities kind of book that would be you know, a, a good option for open access. So I connected with Sarah and honestly, Sarah kind of just took it from there and has to this day is, is helping me out. Um, but at the same time, my book got published with uh, University of Washington Press and uh, they have a special, uh, a series called uh, Feminist Technoscience. And uh, they saw my book as uh, one of those kind of um, interdisciplinary books that could span the sciences as well as the humanities. And, you know, in the sciences, we're a lot more used to open access publications and, um, you know, faculty and students, you know, they often do turn to uh, journal articles and, and um, sources through open access. So I wanted that for my, uh, my, my science colleagues and for my students as well. So my book made sense for the press to be the trial one for an open access um, version. And um, yeah, I, I think 
uh, the my book is also on manifold. And so that is the first part that I was, you know, introduced, okay, this is going to be another type of implementation of the open access where people could, uh, you know, go on to the manifold site and uh, look at the book and even do some kind of annotation, which has been really great for student engagement with, with the book. Um, and then it's also now part of the Tome project. And it's worth mentioning Manifold is, was, um, is a Mellon funded um, publishing platform created by the University of Minnesota Press working with Cast Iron Coating in, in New York. And um, I think we now have 11 tome books that are also available on the Manifold platform. So that's another um, initiative that we've been working with. Um, and Nick, uh, tell us about your uh, thinking. Yeah, so originally, um, I didn't really need to be persuaded to publish open access because I considered it a huge opportunity. And perhaps especially as a political anthropologist, my goal for my research has always been to have some kind of impact or some kind of participation in what can often be very contentious public debates and also to be useful uh, in various ways to the communities where I conducted my research. Uh, you know, in my case, I'm um, doing research on the aftermath of armed conflict in Mayan communities in Guatemala, where, you know, what is true, what is the truth has been a major bone of contention. And especially because the counterinsurgency had its own definition of truth that it was trying to impose on communities. They've had truth commissions that have tried to alter historical narratives. So ever since the beginning of my research, the idea has been to think about how to, you know, use ethnographic information and that kind of engagement to, to speak back to this politics of truth in the country. So that was always something that was on my mind. And of course, then the form of academic work, even though so much, you know, so much energy and so much attention goes into thinking about how to intervene in these debates, the way that academic work is published typically removes all of these, you know, the intellectual interventions away from the actual people that are having these conversations and the lives that are impacted. And so, you know, open access is, is a huge gift and it allows me to share my work broadly in Guatemala with interested scholars, Guatemalan academics who have very limited access to print copies of academic books. I mean, you know, maybe they'll get a, go to a conference every, every couple or few years. I mean, it's incredibly expensive and hard to travel, especially now. Um, most Guatemalan academics, of course, read and speak English or can easily translate little elements of it. And this has allowed for, you know, my research and my book to find some of its most engaged audiences. Um, Guatemalan study, Guatemalan scholars who also study and do research in Guatemala. And so I, I immediately sent out my book in an email to various scholars, sometimes introducing myself by way of, you know, sharing my book. And, and in some cases, reconnecting with some scholars who I'd met maybe once or twice but that we were able to, you know, reconnect in a professional way and say, you know, these are conversations that we're all part of. And so that has been, you know, incredibly nice. And beyond that, one of the biggest criticisms of anthropology, and it's kind of what I was mentioning before is, and this is especially true in indigenous communities, is that the research is for us academics or, you know, other, you know, the scholars themselves, and you're speaking to other academics and that research is often seen as a form of extractivism, extracting knowledge, extracting experiences of suffering and hardship, and then going and writing about them and engaging with cool cutting edge theories for other people in your field. And the, and the goal of it is, even though we may tell ourselves that the goal is to, you know, to, to push thinking along, there's a material reality of it, which is that it's about our careers. And I think that that is something that, you know, anthropologists, this is a long standing critique, you know, hundreds of years old, almost hundred years old at least. And so that's not always true. Of course, academics, you know, don't, we don't make a lot of money on our books in the first place. And often what we write is relevant locally and we try to make it relevant. And, you know, I and many other scholars have published work or translations of our work, you know, or versions of it and distributed it locally and try to be accountable, right, in those ways. But at the same time, there is some truth to the criticism. And a lot of that truth is based on the fact of, you know, paywalls and 
you know, books that are in another language or books that are engaging in conversations at a particular kind of level of abstraction and theoretical. And that's, these are also incredibly important conversations to have, but this is one way to give work back to communities and to bridge divides that, you know, these are longstanding criticisms, no easy answer to those things. Um, and so even in the world of, you know, regular inter-academic dialogue, having an open access book is, a, is the most enhanced or the best kind of business card. You know, we pass around our cards at conferences and how nice is it to be able to say, well, here's a you know, copy of my book. You know, that's a, a beautiful way to do that. And in the era of you know, translation programs, even this can even, you know, that you can actually select you know, paragraphs of text and translate it, maybe not perfectly, definitely not perfectly, and not as artfully as it would be, but this enhances the ability for that to be um, circulated and for the work to matter. And so I think that it's important, uh, open access is incredibly important because it helps us think about who we are engaging with when, we're, when we write, what audiences may or may not be looking at this, hopefully rap widely expanding it. And, and encourages a kind of accountability at different levels. Um, so those are some feelings that I have about open access and the way that I, I mean, my book is still new and it's still circulating and hopefully, you know, it'll be read and, you know, just having your book open access doesn't necessarily mean anybody's gonna read it. It needs to be good. It needs to, you know, connect in ways, but this can bridge a lot of the structural barriers that exist, especially in the field of anthropology and other related social sciences. Great, that's helpful. And there, there are several threads in there I'm gonna to wanna to follow up on uh, for what you just said, Nick. Um, but I wanna first talk to Ed and Angus and give them a chance to talk a bit about um, their thinking about open access and how it may have evolved over the years. And um, your most, as you both said, your most recent books were not away. So if you can give us some, just some of your um, insights into how things may have changed in your fields and in your own thinking. Um, we could start with Angus. Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, yeah, my book, that uh, my last book, it was 2012 when it came out and you know, op open access really was not on the radar screen for me at all as something that people would do with a monograph. Um, but I will, I will say, um, you know, a couple of reasons why I think that was the case and a couple of issues that weigh on authors in history and maybe especially in American history when they're thinking about it, uh, the possibility of open access. I mean, the overriding thing for graduate students finishing, you know, finish their dissertation, trying to get it published, um, the, the overriding concern is the prestige of the press. I and mean, that's really, that's important for them for getting jobs. Um, and it's important for them for, um, for tenure committees down the line. So that's, that's, I think that is and will remain the primary concern. It's one of the things that's really exciting about Tome is trying to resolve that problem while maintaining a, a pathway to an open access future, not to work around it, which I think would be misguided. Um, and then a second concern, and I, you know, I think this is really, this might be a little more for American historians because uh, the, the books can have, uh, in, in many cases, a little bit more of a general academic audience or aim for higher sales figures, uh, reviews in the popular press and so on. Is, that is, uh, is trying to get that audience, trying to get reviews outside of academic journals and, uh, uh, and generate interest beyond the academy. And uh, you know, having these conversations, they made me think a little bit about whether the book that I'm trying to finish right now, I'd, I'd like to publish open access. And that is one of the first questions I'd be asking the, the uh, press is if I, if I was talking about that possibility is will this hurt my ability to, to generate that broader audience outside the academy, even as it, expands the audience within the academy. So I think that's something something else uh, worth keeping in mind. Um, I'll, I'll, I can say a little more, but I'll, I'll stop there and turn it over to Ed. Thanks, Angus. Um, well, for, for me, uh, similarly, the initial conversations about uh, publishing a book that in the end came out in 2017 occurred before open access was really beginning to pick up momentum. Um, I. I did have a lot of conversations with the press about the price point for the book and was very pleased that even the the hardback for fraud was was priced i think at 35 dollars which um, is reasonably affordable for a hardback um it, one one point of uh of friction involved a lot of uh, material that i had that i uh, that was not going to actually be in the book itself that i wanted to make available 
as a companion um, to the volume. And um, in the end, I just developed a, a website, which I've, I've put up uh, at Duke with lots of um, uh, companion materials, a bibliography, uh, discussion of research methods, uh, a lexicon of fraud slang, many other things that are that are there. I think that that enrich the um, uh, the readers a, a sense of what underpins the book. Um, and it would have been great to have folded that in in some way, which an open access channel might have have facilitated. Um, but I, I, you know, a little bit before the the wave was beginning beginning to crest in my case, um, I, I will uh, share Angus's sense that within the historical profession, there's maybe a greater degree of conservatism about the questions that uh, surround open access than perhaps maybe cultural anthropology. I don't know. Um, I, I think while there are definitely historians um, intrigued by open access and embracing it, there are four tome uh, works by historians, for example, um, there, there is uh, a degree of skepticism and concern, uh, partly what will this mean for uh, evaluation and tenure and promotion, um, but also I think a, a concern, especially uh, around making anything available before final publication uh, in terms of what that might mean for excessively early access by other scholars to, um, to research. So uh, historians, at least my perception is, have been fairly slow to take advantage of the preprint options, uh, institutional repositories, uh, using channels like SSRN's um, uh, platform for, for getting research out early. Um, and, and part of that is a, as a concern about, about what would it mean if somebody scoops you? Yeah, that's a, that's a definitely a question that comes up. And the, the question of uh, preprints is very, very, a very interesting one, I think, in particularly in the humanities and social sciences. It's, of course, um, you know, something that's prevalent um, more in the STEM fields. But um, how we deal with that in the humanities and social sciences will be very interesting. Um, there was a, a question in the uh, queue that I think can be very easily answered. Uh, uh, was to Emily about um, the book being priced reasonably, and and I think Ed said the same thing. Um, and the question is, aren't open access books freely available to all? Uh, Emily, do you want to answer that? Um, yeah. So thanks for the opportunity to clarify. So. So there's two different options. Well, I think there might be more, but there's at least two options to purchase my book, which is published open access. So the open access version is a digital version, which is free, which is um, free to anyone anywhere in the world who has the internet link. Um, but there's also a paperback option and that costs, I think around 30 something dollars. So if people want, for whatever reason, they want the physical copy, then that's what they pay for. Great, thank you. Um, that's that's helpful. Um, so. Um, I want to um, turn to, to Debelina here um, and give you a chance to talk about the, your, you have a, a unique perspective, I think, on this, in this group uh, that you bring to um, um, this discussion. So what, you know, what is publishing your book OA taught you um, and in your new position, is it, is it going to you're a senior associate dean of faculty at Emory, and is will that will your experience publishing OA? Will you bring um, what perspective will you bring to that job as a result of this? Yeah. Um, so uh, I think actually um, when I found out early on in the process that the book was gonna uh, go the route of OA, that actually helped me a great deal to think about how to frame the book and actually do the writing. So as a scientist, uh, you know, I've been trained to write articles and, um, and we, we're not trained to write books. Um, but when I was, you know, um, uh, thinking of going up for full professor, my women's studies um, uh, colleagues told me that I would need a book. And so that was, for me, it was a hard kind of you know, um, transition to be thinking in terms of like a 
kind of a larger narrative and an arc and how, how to write a book. I was not trained to do so. So when I found out that the book was actually going to be OA and that one of the features of OA is that, you know, people can just click uh, a link and get to a chapter and read the chapter. They don't, you know, they won't have to purchase the whole book. It's a different kind of orientation to the text. That really helped me to think about each chapter as maybe its own article, you know, um, that could be read. And you didn't have to read the whole book. You would just be able to click on, if you, you're interested in bacteria, you can read the chapter on bacteria. If you want to know about, you know, uh, I have a chapter called Should Feminist Clone, uh, about cloning techniques and, and feminist politics, then you can read that chapter. So that really actually helped me to frame the 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 book itself um and i i was struggling with how, how to how to write it so that was helpful um i think also you know as i mentioned uh you know i have been working on this um journal on uh, catalyst i think uh seeing the success of that small journal um and how it was um uh, getting across to different audiences and not just within academia, that also made me know that this open access book was not just gonna be for scientists working in a lab or feminists that are in academia. And so my audience actually, who I was writing to changed as well. Um, and so uh, those were big influences, I think, when I um, signed on for the OA process. As a senior associate dean of faculty now, um, I will say that uh, the open access experience for me really did, uh, you know, two things. One, I know that uh, the book has um, garnered the attention of audiences that it wouldn't have before, uh, both, uh, you know, locally as well as internationally. And so I think when you're in that phase of, you know, the, of the career where yes, your work needs to get out there, but you also have to show evidence that you're being recognized on a national as well as an international level. OA can help you do that. Um, you know, and I, you know, I've received invitations. We might talk about this a little bit later, but from places I never would have thought my work would be um, uh, accessed and, and read. Uh, and the other thing is that, you know, there is a push to kind of a public facing scholarship that I think all of us as academics, it is really our charge in a way to be responsible for the scholarship that we have and not just uh, you know keep it to ourselves. As Nicholas was saying, there is a responsibility to work with others, to, to learn with others and to uh, communicate knowledges coming from different spaces. And I think that public facing scholarship that OA also allows you to do um, and gets you to that place is something that uh, you know, I would definitely encourage for our faculty. Um, yeah, you raise a great point, and, and um, Nicholas did mention it too about, you know, just the awareness of reaching a broader audience. And um, when I look at the numbers, I've been tallying the, the um, you know, usage numbers for the early tome books. And, you know, these books are selling, typically average book will sell a few hundred copies, whereas the number of downloads and views are averaging over 2,000 per book. So that in and of itself just tells you how much or tells you that you're getting more exposure. And I'm wondering, the question for anybody who wants to, to take this is um, the effect on your writing, um, knowing that you are reaching that broader audience. Um, Debelina mentioned sort of thinking about the book differently in terms of chapters as discrete, discrete units, but also thinking about not just reaching academics, does it change? Will it have an impact on your on your writing? And anyone can jump in here. I mean, I'll just say that my feeling was similar to Debelina. So, um, you know, I write about dance in China. And so there's two audiences there that are outside of the traditional kind of academic audience. So on the one hand, you have dance practitioners who I want to be able to read the book and who are reading the book. Um, and then also um, dance scholars in China. And both of those audiences actually have, you know, I've gotten emails from people who belong to both of those communities who have 
read the book and found it to be really um, beneficial. And I did make an effort to write the book in an accessible way, um, for example, with a strong narrative um, and putting a lot of the discussions of engagement with secondary scholarship into the footnotes. And so um, those, yeah, so I did definitely think about these larger audiences in a way that might have been theoretical if it weren't open access, but it felt very real once it was open access. Anybody else want to jump in? I can comment on this a little bit. Uh, you know, I started writing my book not knowing about open access, of course, is my dissertation. And, you know, we have these ideas in anthropology of writing and having, or, you know, politically engaged anthropology um, or particular versions of it, of engaging with communities. And so they're in, in your mind, but then we wind up writing in ways that aren't necessarily as engaged or as, or as accessible. Um, for multiple different audiences. And I think one of my biggest audiences is development professionals um, and who are probably not that interested in a lot of the theoretical discussion. And so clarity is, is very important there, although they have a lot of influence and power. So you want people to take these ideas up and you want them to engage with them and, and also to have them be responsible as well as a mechanism of you know, keeping other communities responsible. Uh, but in the later stages of the final editing, when I knew that the book would be coming out as open access, I did, it, it changed the way, it just changes the way you look at your text. Sometimes you're like, okay, well, this is going to go live in a way that a book on a, a shelf, and it's actually kind of scary to think about so many people reading your work. I mean, it's, you know, on the one hand, you want people to read it. And on the other hand, academically, I mean, my experience with external reviewers is, you know, a form of tough love where you get a lot of feedback and it can be a painful and very humbling experience. And so the idea of, you know, really being in public and really saying, you know, speaking to audiences around the world in perhaps simultaneously, I think it, it, it does raise the stakes or it raises the feeling. And I think actually that could be really good because deeply engaged academic writing in that way, I think it, you know, it forces us to think you know, harder about who am I communicating with? Who are these audiences? And these are questions that, you know, good editors will tell you, you should always be thinking about these things. You should always be writing clearly. You should probably always put a lot of the theoretical discussion in footnotes, right? I mean, these are the comments we get from editors. It's like, this is not your dissertation. You're not writing this for, you know, for five people. You know, you, you want to engage more. And so I think that they enhance what's already good about the writing that we should have already been doing. And they, you know, I think it could potentially change the change the discussion. And just to, you know, to broaden this a little bit out from that, I mean, going forward, you know, since tenure, I've been doing a lot more writing for open access things that are just online, that are, they're academic adjacent. The ideas that inform them are academic. Uh, I'm writing a lot of things in translation, Spanish, English, and I'm writing for, you know, Guatemalan audiences and for international audiences too. Uh, and I think that that is, you know, kind of the, the ethic going forward with open access is to kind of have this public facing um, research, especially, you know, people that are trying to engage these public debates and not all scholarship is trying to do that in the same way. And I think that's also very important and it does, you know, and these, ac these conversations are incredibly important, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're all doing the same kind of um, public engaged thinking or scholarship. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there for, for the moment. So, Ed, um, I had a question for you, and, and um, Angus can weigh in as well. When we were talking earlier, I think you mentioned, um, you know, you do have this experience with publishing some open access material, and you mentioned, I think, that some of the some of the ancillary materials you published had a, a lot of um, viewership, a lot of people accessed it. Um, does how, how has that kind of affected your thinking about about OA? The, the primary example uh, there actually had to do with a version of preprint, I guess. So um, I also edited a book, uh, co-edited a book with David Moss in 2009, Government and Markets Toward a New Theory of Regulation, uh, interdisciplinary uh, volume with contributions from across the social sciences. Um, and we were able to negotiate, in that case, uh, open access before publication to 
versions of the chapters uh, that were essentially preprints. And, and the, um, there were tens of thousands of downloads of different pieces of that, of that volume. Um, in part, that's because we had, uh, we had a, a piece in there from Elizabeth Warren, uh, early version of her call for the consumer creation of the Financial Protection Bureau, um, and some other very prominent authors in, in the book. Um, but that also, those downloads came from over 100 countries. And um, what that has really, that experience has, has suggested to me is um, several things. First of all, uh, the way in which more open access can drive print uh, uh, demand in some cases. I, I don't think that happens in every instance, but it certainly happens uh, not infrequently. Um, it has suggested to me uh, the, the value of this mechanism for uh, achieving the core goals of, of any research university, which is not just the creation of knowledge, but it's effective dissemination. And I just would like to, to uh, echo uh, Nicholas's emphasis on the, the obligation that scholars have uh, to engage with really significant public debates um, uh, locally, nationally, and, and globally. Um, I do think, uh, and of course, Tome is a, a key uh, experiment uh, in this regard. We have to think very carefully about how to achieve those goals in a sustainable fashion. So the, the question about what the uh, long-term business model for open access might look like, and of course, that, that might, there might not be one answer there, there might be many answers there. Um, is one that we all have to think about. And I, I certainly am thinking about that quite a lot these days, um, partly as an author and as a historian, but also as, as a, a vice provost at Duke who works very closely with Duke University Press. Uh, so, so I think every academic press is trying to think through that sustainability question. That's great um, and very helpful. Um, we had a question and I think Angus is gonna take this one on about um, the idea of an embargo, like would it have changed your thinking if your book had an embargo period where the book is toll access first, perhaps for a year to allow the press to recover costs um, and then go OA? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I, I, I think, I, I mean, I'd be very supportive of that idea. And it would be to me, if I was signing up with a press and I was going with a convention, taking the conventional route, the idea that it would eventually be open access would be a major selling point. Um, you know, I, I'd, I'd say a couple of things about that. I mean, one is I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a very uh, ardent believer in and active user in, uh, of our university repository where you can take, you know, pieces that you publish in journals that are not freely accessible outside subscriptions and often deposit versions, whether the original version, some journals let you do that or, or sometimes an author version so that they do become freely accessible. And my experience has been, it's not scientific at all, but is that when you do that, your work gets gets cited quite a bit more. Uh, it's easier to share, it's easier to cite, it's easier to use. And it's also reflective of exactly what Ed was saying about the, um, the mission of, you know, if you're, if you're writing your work, you're writing for it to, to be read. And it's frustrating if you feel like people are not able to access it because of their uh, individual circumstances. So uh, at the same time, you recognize that if you, if you want a print book and if you want a print book that as I was saying earlier is gonna, um, is, is gonna be broadly disseminated and reviewed as such, you know, often there will be a prerogative where the press wants to have some sort of exclusive right to it for a period of time. And that the life of these books is hopefully very long. And so the idea that, you know, you, you, you satisfy that need, but then eventually people are able to access and use your work over a 20, 30 year, an ongoing period when it's still an active part of a scholarly conversation is, 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 re is really appealing. And would help you to achieve over time a lot of those goals I was talking about that institution institutional repositories uh, help to fulfill. Uh, just just quickly jumping in on that point, um, I would be very interested in an OI option at this point. Um, you know, the there are very few authors for whom I mean I think the 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 book fraud did very well, but the sales are now uh, declining as is normally the case after a few years. And uh, I'd be willing to make the bet, actually, that if it were to become OA, the print sales would go up. All right, I think we are at the at our break point. Um, so we're going to take about a 10 minute break and come back. Um, and um, feel free for those of you watching or listening to um, 
ask questions. And I'd like everybody, the panelists, to think about when we come back, just some um, talk a bit about experiences that you've had or, or what you've seen since uh, your open access book, for those of you who publish open access, the way you think the open access edition had an impact on how the book has been received. You know, anecdotes of, you know, did you get invited to conferences that you might not have invited to speak somewhere? So give that some thought and we will return in 10 minutes. Thanks everybody. Welcome back everyone. Um, thanks for uh, sticking with us and I encourage you all to um, put um, questions in the um, Q&A if you have them. Um, what I wanted to start with though was I sort of primed the pump for this beforehand. I wanted to get folks reactions to just those who have published OA, just evidence that you've seen that that open access edition has had an impact on how the book's been received, how you've been received. And um, why don't we start with uh, Debelina? Sure. Um, I have been very um, pleased with how open access has spread the word about the book. Uh, one of the first invitations that I received uh, to talk on molecular feminisms was from this undergraduate group of uh, young women who identify as feminists who are in STEM and they call themselves Fem STEM at Colorado College. And so they were students in chemistry, in physics, in biology who came across the book because of open access and invited me to give a talk. And, you know, um, I, I guess one of the audiences that I had imagined for the book were, you know, was the, the feminists working away in the lab at the bench and um, hoping to get across to them. And that for sure happened because of, of open access. Then another invitation that came uh, was for a philosophy roundtable uh, of other faculty and graduate students. So it was exactly doing that work. That was another audience, you know, so there, there is some kind of humanities and a philosophy of science um, grounding in the book. Um, and then, I, you know, so I have received multiple in, uh, uh, invitations to talk about the book around the world. And, you know, I got invitations from Singapore and then the pandemic happened, but I had received, and this one I think to date is my favorite, and I, I hope it does get to happen after the pandemic, uh, is that I received an invitation for uh, to keynote at a gender studies symposium um, in Bucharest. And part of the invitation was that there would be a visit to Dracula's castle. <laughs> so I know for sure OA is responsible for my, you know, invitation to visit Dracula's castle. Um, that's, 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 that's a span. So. That's excellent. Um, Nick, I know you had some, uh, some anecdotes too. So, uh, you know, like I said, my book is still new and I'm, uh, well, it's a year old at this point, but I've, uh, today, in fact, I'll be giving, uh, my first invited talk about that book, um, at what, it was scheduled for just before the pandemic hit. It was scheduled for, I think it was uh, March 18th or something. And then everything collapsed, of course. And so it's now been rescheduled into a Zoom meeting for today. And it's for a broad audience. It's for um, the Polson Institute of Development Studies at, at Cornell. And I'm really excited to present. And it's a, an audience that will have, uh, it's this new program that's been created with their extension agents. There are uh, people who do, you know, agrarian research, people who are more on the technical side, in addition to, to people who are doing kind of critical agrarian studies work. And I think this is a, you know, it's a nice opportunity, you know, when you think about audiences that are so, you know, diverse in their orientations and in their own intellectual and professional projects, a lot of people who may or may not be inclined to pick up an academic book because it's, you know, from a discipline that they don't necessarily read. Well, if it's openly available to them, I think that, and you make points and you make a couple of inroads, I think that there are some opportunities for people to say, well, I'll go ahead and check it out, you know, because it's, because it's right here. And then with the job or not the job, but the, with the, with the presentation or the, the announcement for the, uh, for the talk, there's a link to the book, you know, and the, the emails go around, um, what I started doing was putting the link to the um, the open access site on Cornell Press on my on my email, 
and just as a way that anybody who wants to download this book can can get it. I've also have it now on my uh, my Twitter bio. So anybody who uh, not that I have a huge following, but like you know that that's a way for people to you know to get something that and I, and I think it's pretty rare. I don't really see that too often. You know, we often look for full length monographs out there, and there you know you can find really older versions. Um, that are online. And I think that, uh, you know, sometimes it's not even a question of not having access or not having a library copy, but it's having a digital version of something is incredibly nice. You know, these are searchable from keywords. I mean, that's a way of relating to a text that is, you know, as an academic, we have all these, you know, we finally have our, it, our now our, a lot of our filing cabinets are folders on our desktop and we can, okay, well, here's the theme and I'm looking for this thing and you have a huge body of scholarship in article form and then you can do keyword searches for things like you know in mass scale so i think that that invitation for my talk today was based on people who and this is a fun experience and i'm you know i feel like i'm still fairly junior scholar but you know having somebody send you an email where they're quoting a piece out of your book a passage out of your book saying this is a conversation we've been wanting to have it's like this is so exciting you know i'm wow yeah i thought you know when you get into the 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 levels of writing a chapter about something, you know, sometimes you forget that, you know, people do care, you know, people are out there that are really listening to it. And so uh, I'm excited for that opportunity. I'm excited to, you know, I'm hoping that this conversation is also an opportunity for more people to think, hey, these books are out there and they're open access. And I know that these are exciting things for people. People want their work to be read. And that I think that there's going to be increasing demand uh, for public facing scholarship on the part and there it may be a change in the orientation of the people who uh, who are doing the writing are going to have that desire even if they're not able to get into it I think that's an orientation that we're going to see see more of Angus you wanted to weigh in yeah I just wanted to jump in as a as a journal editor um, you know I, I just to, to build on something Nicholas was just saying is uh, that shareability and social media is is is, is really important yeah, um, Cam, uh, our journals with Cambridge University Press, and they let us occasionally have articles be published open access if they're, um, if they, you know, if we think they might generate some excitement. And you know, we've had we had one uh, just a few months ago that got got that we made open access. We let people know it was open, and it got shared more than ten times as much as any normal article we publish. If people people don't want to tweet about something that's paywalled. I mean, it's just not um, uh, that's just too much of a hurdle. And so having uh, scholarship freely accessible for people to cite in in public forums like that actually can, can grossly expand the uh, the potential discussion surrounding it. Great and that's a I want to put in a shameless plug for uh, later today. Um, that's going to be an important subject. Uh, Charles Watkinson and I in our in our next session will be talking about giving a report on Tome, um, the three-year report and and Charles in particular will be talking about the importance of altmetrics and and um, using social media and it definitely shows up in the in the early numbers as to what helps a book be successful and we actually will um, will look specifically at Emily's book and Debelina's book as two examples so um, um, please stay tuned for that um, anybody Peter, else? Go, go if, ahead. If, I, if I could just jump in, Peter, sure. I just I want to link the last couple of comments and actually yours as well to the question that's just come up in the Q and A, right? Um, which asks how how can one actually move the standards in promotion and tenure cases to take it, uh, account of the the evolution of communications mechanisms and to actually facilitate a transition to more open access. And I, I think here the, the crucial question, this is another element, I, I think a really key element of the sustainability issue, um, is defining standards of excellence that, that people see as legitimate. Um, and there's work to be done there. Uh, so we've had several references to usage through open access, but what, what kind of usage? What do we mean by usage? How do we define it? What, what, what do we mean by a download? Um, and of course, there, there are emerging alt metrics that, that provide, I think, a lot of substance to the conversation. And we also have seen, at least at Duke, through uh, some internal discussions, uh, of course, that 
what we, we assume are uh, the gold standard, things like impact factor, uh, have all kinds of, of limitations to them and also all kinds of biases built into them. Um, so they're, 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 the process that we, that we need now is one of um, extending and amplifying the role that, for example, university presses have played in establishing excellence in scholarship uh, so that we have parallel kinds of, of metrics and um, modes of, of assessment and evaluation that take account of things like social media presence. It's not straightforward, it's not easy, but it's absolutely essential if we're gonna be able to make the case holistically from university to university about how tenure standards, promotion standards need to take account of this new reality and then facilitate it. Uh, Emily, you wanted to weigh in? Yeah, it was a more on the previous topic, but on this point, I agree that um, the standards of excellence are the most important thing, at least I know at my institution. And so the peer review process being um, unchanged, I think is critical. Um, I think that's even more important than usage statistics, because oftentimes you go up for tenure before those statistics are even available because your book just came out. So from my perspective, it's more about the peer review process having integrity. And also the peer review process makes the book better in the end. So you need it not just for the external approval, but actually to maintain the quality of the book. So for me, that's the most important factor. Um, and then just on the earlier point of, you know, anecdotes about the book reaching wider audiences, I have noticed that um, I've gotten, so I've gotten a lot of international invitations to speak about the book, but I've gotten some from unexpected places. So for example, from museum curators, um, and then also from um, the National Folk Dance Ensemble of Serbia, you know, because they were able to access the open access. So I think I'm reaching audiences that I never even imagined as my potential readers. And if I could just add a point about, um, you know, the this discussion of standards of excellence. So part of my job as Dean of Faculty is to oversee tenure and promotion in the college. And uh, this has been happening at least at Emory for some years now where, um, and open access is maybe part of this conversation, but establishing those standards of excellence um, is kind of a conversation that hap should happen at the university level, at the college level, but also at department level. So I think it's important for junior scholars to bring these topics up as well if, the ch if your chairs of your departments are not. To say, can we think about what counts as standards of excellence? And you know, I'm not in a field where you know, it's easily accessible or it's meaningful to have an H index, right? So can we talk about what would count as impact? For example, that you know, your work is not only being picked up by other scholars, but by museums and by you know, um, not-for-profit organizations. So I, I think that it, it is a conversation that can't just happen top down. Um, yeah. I have a, one anecdote that I would throw in here from a different side of this um, um, kind of usage and, and impact story. So when I was at Cornell University Press, I was overseeing the anthropology list and um, I received a book proposal from a young scholar working on um, Southeast Asia in an area where it's really difficult typically to sell, um, to, to, to break even on, on books we publish. But the author was able to tell me that, um, he showed me that he had had an article in the flagship journal of the Anthropology Association that had been the number one downloaded article for the previous year. And that convinced me to, to have the book reviewed and it got positive reviews and it ended up being a successful book more so than I would have expected. And there, I think the, um, the, uh, the article was open access and it helped to kind of prepare the way for the book coming, it, it sort of paved paved the way for this author, and he's gone on to be, you know, a very successful writer. Um, question of translation came up um, in the chat, and I wanted to see if folks wanted to weigh in at all on that. So this this question of of um, you know when a, when a we talked earlier about the book being uh, having a Creative Commons license and some Creative Commons licenses are more permissive than others. And in many cases, historians and, and humanity scholars want a more restrictive license with no derivatives, the ND part of the CC license. Um, how do you all feel about um, that and how it maybe impacted your thinking about the translation of your work? 
Um, I can start with that just because my book is under contract for a Chinese public uh, Chinese translation to come out next year. Um, and in that case, because I read Chinese, like I wanted to be able to have a say in being able to authorize that translation. And so that was important to me. And the fact that University of California Press, um, the contract was such that I maintained, as, as the author, I maintained the ownership, I guess, of the copyright. So I was able to directly negotiate that and the press didn't even have to be involved. So in my case, that worked out well. I'm yet, you know, it'll be perhaps different if it, someone from another country wants to do the translation. I'm not sure, you know, if they, it seems like they won't be able to do that without my permission, which I guess I'm okay with as long as they can still, if I can grant that permission, that's my understanding of the situation. So to me, the open access doesn't really create a barrier um, for that, but I'd be curious to hear from others. Any other thoughts on, on that? I think Charles, you had an interesting point if you're still there, Charles Watkinson, about um, sort of the different perspective that a, that a publisher brings. Yeah, it was just, uh, um, I think it's, it, it, it's just this acknowledgement that tr the translation market is, is uh, complicated. And um, uh, if one is uh, uh, passionate about uh, equity of access, one has to remember that uh, there are markets, book markets, which are pre still predominantly print markets, and affordable print editions is really the focus. And so how we incentivize local publishers in those markets, in Africa, in China, um, to produce those, in India as well, to produce those affordable print editions. We have to be sensitive about uh, what a local language OA ebook edition might do to their incentives. So some of these areas are a little bit complicated and we have to think thoughtfully about equity. And that's a, a, a good way to bring us around to the, the, the question that's come up in a number of uh, these um, chats and so forth is a, partly a question of sustainability um, of a program like Tome and, um, and issues of equity with, with um, not every, perhaps not every institution being able to support um, publication of monographs with $15,000 subventions. Um, what are your all thoughts about sort of the, uh, both the sort of making this program sustainable and um, you know, the equity question? I think the, the first point to make is that the, the, the parameters in North America particularly in the United States, are just different from what they are in Europe. So in, in Europe, you have a, an emerging system where uh, state support for research is then connected to an expectation of open access. And that's most clearly delineated with journal articles, but it's, it's almost certainly coming for books as well. And um, it's just a cleaner conversation. Uh, it's just much messier in the United States because of the lack of that type of public support for research outside the sciences. Inside the sciences, it's not that dissimilar. You have the NSF, you have the NIH, who are moving along a, 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 an analogous path with respect to um, the, the work that they support. Um, what it means in the humanities and interpretive social sciences is just much more, much more complicated. And I think it creates um, a huge set of obstacles to finding that sustainable path. One, one of the questions in the Q&A noted, goodness, uh, university budgets are about to go under enormous pressure. They already are under enormous pressure. There are gonna be significant cuts this year, probably next year. Where, where is the, the space gonna be in those budgets for an OA subvention? And the further you move down uh, the financial strength of, of, uh, of universities, the more that's going to be a, a really significant question. Um, so there's, there's a desire for access for readers, but we also, uh, as the, the question I think is pointing out, we need to be very attentive to the questions of equity about producers and the scholars who are working in less well-resourced institutions. This is, uh, this is not actually offering an easy answer. It's just noting the, the difficulties of the, of, the, of the issue. I have a thought about, uh, um, I have a thought about not, is, not to answer the equity question, which I think is already uh, almost irresolvable 
question we think about the chasm of inequality between institutions and between you know scholars positioned at different institutions and between disciplines and different institutions in terms of equity these are deep problems but i also think that the sustainability and the business model question of academic publishing in general is in some broad way linked to open access scholarship is devalued in as you know in american society i would say very much so and it's and at worst it's under attack the academy's under attack, intellectualism and science are under attack, funds are drying up as a result of that. And I think there are a lot of attacks on scholarship and, and scholars individually that are based on caricatures of what scholarship is and what we have to offer and the kinds of interventions that we would like to make. Uh, you know, and our response, unfortunately, is a little bit slow. We are not necessarily up to the challenge. There are mass media pylons substitute for any kind of real engagement. Many scholars have lost their jobs, right? In the fray of this, um, public discourse is a house of mirrors. It's limited at best, and it's deeply pathological, right? At its worst. And, you know, ironically, in, in a time of extensive access to information, what we have is a suffocation of discourse through deliberate dispersal of misinformation um, that's based on eliciting different kinds of affective and, you know, responses. Um, and for political purposes. And we have so much to offer public debate and in a thoughtful, more slowed down fashion. And, but what we have to offer is unfortunately, it doesn't, it, I mean, one of the biggest questions we have, we have major questions that I think scholarship has provided wonderful answers to. Um, we need to uh, rethink what constitutes a healthy, just and sustainable um, economy. We are grappling publicly with deep-seated racial inequality, ecological collapse, rising tide of fascism. And, you know, for those public-facing scholars on Twitter, that's not really a forum to have these conversations. It's a how it's, you know, people can throw things out and clash in different ways. And but it's not the kind of space where we can meaningfully have the dialogues that we need about moving forward to get past the, you know, the the politically interested kind of misinformation and to have, you know more of a democratic space of dialogue. And I think that open access can help us, A, get into those debates and also maybe to be used, if, if open access is a growing space of scholarship, then it can be used as a space of saying, look, scholarship is doing, you know, we are not hiding away in an ivory tower and we're not, um, you know, we're not just talking to ourselves that there's a growing ethos of it. And it goes beyond, you know, monograph publication, it's about, it's about public engagement on the topics that, that we engage with and that we write about and that we think about and to bravely and courageously engage um, with, those, with those discussions. So I think that, you know, the more that we do to demystify and to get rid of the caricature about what academic work really is and the kind of conversations we're really having, which frankly just are not part of these public conversations. And I think that, and this is a longer term issue, but hopefully, you know, by demonstrating the value of academic work, maybe there might be more funding in the future and, you know, more egalitarian funding at that, so. I have one comment, um, sort of, if, if we have time. Um, sure. I feel this is also an issue of equity among disciplines because so much uh, is invested financially by institutions into the sport of research in the STEM fields, um, in terms of the, the scale of resources that go into supporting research, and I think, Monographs are primarily published by human, humanists and to a certain extent social scientists. And so this is a way that institutions um, need to support that research um, in my view. And so I think that's one aspect of the equity issue. Um, in addition, of course, to the issue of different institutions having different levels of funding to provide. And I think I've noticed that some professional organizations are now offering uh, publication subventions. So like Association for Asian Studies has one um, and there's some others that have those. So that might be a way to make these subventions available to people who are at institutions that don't necessarily have the support um, for this kind of a subvention. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll just make another point about equity, which is that it, I mean it, it it is worth contrasting the the potential inequities of this emerging possible system with the inequities of the old system, <laughs> um, just in the sense that you know university presses have this very strange dual role in that they are you know on the one hand evaluating the quality of work and on the other hand evaluating the potential sales, 
and um, and you know that, that those potential sales figures play. The, I mean, my impression is it plays a, a really major role in determining what gets published and what doesn't, which is which is often disconnected in meaningful ways from the impact of a work in a in a field of study. And so, you know, it, switching the funding model, yes, it will create new new inequities, but it might actually help to resolve some of those uh, market pressures that. Um, that play an excessive role right now determining what's get published, what gets published by which presses. Great, we have um, about two minutes left. And I, there was a question in here about, um, about we've talked about metrics and usage data and, and we know that it's not, it's difficult to interpret some of this data and we need to get better at that. But as authors, do you, um, do you, how do you take advantage or do you use, um, do you follow like how your book is doing in social media and how many downloads it's getting? And do you use that information at all? And if it were, I guess if it were more readily available and more sophisticated, would you use it more? Emily? Yeah, I mean, I, I look at my statistics on the Luminous page and I have also, I have to admit, I've posted them on Facebook. Like I have 1,000 downloads and just to like generate excitement. And so I would love to have more. I actually have not been doing a very good job to, to find out the stats. And in fact, Peter, you showed us something. I had no idea that my book was being read in China, for example. Um, yeah, so I, I need to do a better job of that, but it is, it's great. It's great that that kind of data is available. I will share with you both, um, as I said, where I'm going to talk about your books later today, and I'll share that information with you if you can't be there for the discussion, but you'll be able to see uh, what I've been able to collect so far. It's very impressive. Um, any final thoughts um, in this uh, last minute or two? Um, anybody want to um, add a final um, thought to, to tie a bow on this? <laughs> uh, I'll just throw one one uh, bit of perspective, which is um, if this is the future, we need to be thinking much more intentionally and systematically about how to uh, integrate this type of discussion into graduate education. Mm -hmm. So um, many of the comments today have referenced advice that came from a mentor. And by definition, really, the mentors don't have any clue about this kind of thing. And that's a, that's a challenge, uh, but it's one that we should be paying attention to. Excellent. That's a fabulous point. Uh, one that I was uh, hoping we'd come back to. So I think um, we will uh, wrap things up right now. And um, I think Peter Berkery will um, close us out. Uh, yeah, thanks, Peter. I have to confess that was a fantastic conversation. I felt like a bit of a fraud trying to summarize uh, uh, all the great points uh, that have been made. Uh, and to that, um, you know, uh, Judy, Jessica, Peter, and I get caught up frequently in kind of the day-to-day -day bits of administering the program and all the other aspects of the work that we do. Um, and uh, we forget that it's actually not about the presses or the libraries or even the provost. It's about the scholars. And so having this conversation today uh, has just, and recentering the scholars, in tome has been absolutely fantastic. So I'm actually really grateful for that opportunity. I think a couple of themes uh, that emerge that are, are, are gonna be super important uh, are, uh, you know, Peter early on mentioned the uh, difference between uh, selling somewhere between 150 and 250 print copies and getting an average of 2000 downloads for a monograph. It's huge, that's transformational. And it's kind of the, the, it's what we've been going for for the past well, three years of the program and what, Judy, maybe 17 years of negotiating the program before that. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I think that some of the, some of the, uh, uh, the new opportunities, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about translations, which is exciting and kind of, I think, something we hadn't really fully thought through in the early days of the program. So there's something new for us to all uh, to, to take back and think about. Um, uh, it was interesting to see uh, some old school conversations uh, uh, in the chat room and in the Q&A about embargoes. Uh, of course, the, uh, uh, the Tome's term of reference does not allow for uh, uh, an embargo, uh, but there are other uh, pilots and other experiments out there that do. Um, the, uh, I think the equity issue is and remains hugely important. We knew when we started Tome 
that it was going to be a challenge, but we just felt that that it, we couldn't freight the pilot with a solution to something so complicated, uh, but it has loomed over us the entire time. Uh, and uh, I couldn't say anything substantively more eloquently than Nicholas did, so I'll just leave that at that. Uh, I, I thought uh, uh, Ed's comments about metrics were super important, and uh, it made me think, and someone mentioned in the Q&A, it made me think a little bit about whether the, the humetrics that Chris Long is developing uh, up at Michigan State might not play a role uh, in helping us find something to replace what, you know, presses and scholars have used for decades, which is dollars, uh, to, to as, as a surrogate for how successful uh, the scholarly argument embedded in a monograph actually is. Um, and uh, I see that it's 1131 on uh, uh, my laptop anyway. So uh, those are, I think, great takeaways for the three sponsoring organizations. Um, and once again, to the scholars, thank you so much for giving us so much great stuff to think about. And hopefully we'll see everybody again at one o'clock. Thanks, yes, Peter. Yeah, thanks to everybody who uh, uh, participated. I didn't have to use the mute button at all. So <laughs> well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. <clears throat>